because it's not just an important struggle against police surveillance or against, you know, in defense of privacy rights and, you know, against government wrongdoing. But to see it in the class sense, would like to talk about what I tried to address in other forums as well about C-51, is to examine the political context of this legislation, see it in relationship to the larger agenda of this government and, in fact, the agendas of capitalist governments around the world, because this is not a unique phenomenon by any means. There are mass demonstrations taking place right now in Spain against anti-terrorism legislation that's being introduced there, in the Netherlands, in Germany. This is not a coincidence. And it tells us, in fact, that this isn't just the Harper government operating. And if there wasn't the Harper government, another bourgeois government, the liberals, would be doing the same thing. So we need to, in a way, draw back and see the bigger picture. See, well, why is this happening? And if we come to the conclusion that the way that this is being sold to Canadians, namely, it's necessary to protect Canadians from the scourge of terrorism, and jihadists and you know, fundamentalist extremist uh, acts of terror. And we say, well, you know, there's something else afoot here. There's another reason for it. And we need to put that in context. Why, if not that, if it's not a genuine effort to protect us from the bad guys, from the evildoers, then why is this being done? You know, they passed another piece of legislation back in December, uh, and I don't know if, you know, it, it got some attention, not as much attention as C-51. It was called Bill C-13. People remember that? This was the, uh, and quote, unquote, it was called Protecting Canadians from Online Crime Bill, right? So you start noticing a pattern, you know, Every piece of legislation is protecting Canadians from terror, protecting Canadians from cyberbullying, protecting Canadians from, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What, what, will, they, what will they come up next? Uh, you know, protecting Canadians from strike-happy union bosses, yeah. protecting Canadians from uppity Aboriginal organizations, uh, or, or tree-hugging environmentalists, and what, what have you. know, but th this is what they're trying to do, is to fashion that, Number one, we're afraid, we're under threat, we're fearful, we have anxiety, we have economic insecurity, um, we have anxiety for the future, and now we have a, a, a benevolent government that's going to protect us, right? Father image is going to, you know, big arms going to, you know, to, to protect us. Well, if we become... We've come to the conclusion, uh, and this is not the ravings of, uh, you know, some sort of paranoid uh, malcontent, but, you know, <laughs> you look at it objectively, you say, well, there's something else behind it. Then we have to start analyzing that. Well, if not that, if it's not being done for benevolent and uh, justified reasons, then why is it happening? And why is it happening in country after country after country? And what we have uh, uh, projected, at least for our part in this discussion, uh, from the perspective of, of our party, is that this is uh, taking place um, because the system itself of capitalism is going into deeper and deeper crisis. Uh, some of you have, have uh, you know, read articles in people's voice, or you might have heard me on previous visits talk about, you know, the economic crisis that started in the 2008, and the fact that that crisis is continuing, which, by the way, it is. Yeah. It is. If you look at the situation in Europe, for instance, and the European Union, uh, and many other parts of the world, the, the global economy continues to be uh, extremely volatile. There is no substantive recovery in terms of growth rates or uh, economic development, and in many respects, um, the uh, um, the blight of, of mass unemployment on a global scale is continuing uh, at, at very high levels. But it's not just 
that crisis, that cyclical crisis that exploded in 2008 that I'm referring to, but a more uh, structural, more generalized crisis of capitalism, which we could track back, uh, I would suggest, even to the 70s. Even to the 70s. What started to happen in the, in the 70s? Well, the rates of profit of monopoly started to decline in a rather precipitous rate. And the rates of growth, particularly of the largest uh, capitalist states, uh, started to decline. And the ruling class at that time decided, we can't afford this anymore. We cannot afford the welfare state. They brought in the welfare state after the Second World War because they were worried about socialism. And they were worried about the alternative that it presented to the working classes around the world. Um, uh, Soviet Union, uh, the, the, you know, the, the gathering revolution in China, um, the spread of socialist uh, governments in Eastern Europe, the Cuban Revolution, all of these kinds of things, well, spread, you know, fear and loathing in the ranks of monopoly. And they decided that, well, in order to cut that off at the pass and keep people uh, quiescent, especially the working class, and popular forces, we better bring in unemployment insurance. We better bring in health care reform. We better develop public pension programs and so on and so forth so that people wouldn't rise up in revolution. And they could afford to do it because it was a period of expansion of capitalism. And so the capitalists were prepared to take some of their mass profits in the form of higher taxes that they paid into the state and the state used for these social programs. But by the mid-70s, when the rates of profit started to decline, they said, we can't afford this luxury anymore. And they abandoned Keynesianism and the welfare state, and they turned on it with a vengeance. And that's when Thatcherism started, and Reaganism, and the Chicago School of Economics, and monetary, uh, monetarism, and, and one, which then morphed into what we now call the neoliberal agenda, or the Washington Consensus. And what was that? Free trade, which we know is not really about trade at all, but the mo mobility of capital around the world. Um, privatization, deregulation, um, changing the state itself and its role from any kind of redistributive, redistributive functions, um, um, whether it was social welfare or public education and what have you. Um, and you know, neoliberalism was very effective. It was great for the ruling class. They did very well. Their profits soared. Their accumulation of wealth and the centralization of wealth uh, took off like a rocket. And in country after country after country, the gap between the rich and the poor grew ever wider. And the rich became the super rich. And the super rich became the mega super rich. You know? it, <laughs> it was, uh, you know, it, 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 it's, it, it was very successful. And meanwhile, real wages, real uh, social conditions and living standards of the people declined. And the gap between the wealthy countries and the poor countries grew, and the gaps within each country became ever wider. But in many respects, it was an artificial growth. And it was a growth based on financialization and the spread of indebtedness and public debt, household debt, corporate debt, and state debt. And they just kept churning out money and they kept it going and so on and so forth. And, and uh, there was a crisis of overproduction. And so to solve that problem, they just increased the burden, the, the amount of debt until finally it became unsustainable, and it burst. And it burst in 2008, right, with the meltdown. Okay, but what happened after 2008? And here again, our party was one of the first to come out and say, 
you know, <laughs> this is not just a crisis of uh, the banks, and it's not just a crisis of financialization. It is a crisis of capitalism as a system. And they're going to try and make us pay for that crisis. And that's what they did. That's what they did. And they brought in austerity programs all over the, you know, in some cases, you know, more uh, intense, in other cases less intense. But nevertheless, there was uh, a new consensus that in order to uh, pull out of this crisis, we have to make the people pay because the ruling class was not prepared to pay for that crisis. And in fact, they got bailouts, the amounts of trillions upon trillions of dollars. Um, well, what did that lead to? It led to increasing resistance by the working class. And you know, although it wasn't as palpable or on the same level everywhere in the world, there were, was growing resistance in Latin America. It took the form of the struggle for national sovereignty against U.S. imperialism. And you saw the advance of left governments, of uh, socialist-oriented governments, first in Venezuela, then in Bolivia and Ecuador, and, and you know, left-center uh, coalitions were being elected in Uruguay and in, in uh, uh, in Brazil and, uh, and so on, uh, to the point that uh, the interests of U.S. capital were being impinged upon more and more uh, in this hemisphere. In Europe, it took the form of mass mobilizations, general strikes, not just in Greece or in Italy or in Spain, but in fact, you know, virtually everywhere uh, in, in, in Europe, even in countries like, like Germany. Or despite the fact that German capital is very strong, nevertheless, you know, the German working class started to mobilize and to fight back as well in France and so on. And so you have a situation where the system itself is becoming more and more unstable, more and more volatile. And people are, the class struggle, even though it's not always as consciously led or um, focused, nevertheless, the class struggle is increasing and resistance is increasing. And it's in those circumstances that then their answer is to increase the repressive role of the state and to bring in these types of legislation. Now that's the kind of analysis which I think a lot of people sense, but which a lot of the other organizations in this movement will articulate. But that's really what's happening. That's why this assault is coming as it, as it is. And that um, uh, poses not only uh, questions, but also gives a, uh, an indication of, at least from our point of view, why this struggle is as important as it is, because it's not just an important struggle against police surveillance or against, you know, in defense of privacy rights and, 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 uh, and, and, uh, and, and, you know, against government wrongdoing. But to see it in the class sense, that this is part and parcel of the defense of, of capital. How do they do it? They use fear. They use the anxiety and the, and the economic insecurity of the people. Then they say, we're going to protect you. Then they find scapegoats, right? Visible minorities, national and religious uh, communities, uh, aboriginal peoples, environmentalists, anybody who's threatening the security of the state, trade unions that go on strike. You know, ever since Harper got his majority for three or three and a half years ago, this government in Ottawa has uh, forced more workers through back-to-work legislation, has broken a more um, uh, uh, labor struggles than any other government in the same period of time. And it's not by accident. And when they have done it, they have said what? We're doing it because this, uh, this labor uh, disruption uh, is affecting the Canadian economy, or it's, it's, it's unhinging our recovery or it's threatening the economic security of Canada. 
Well, if you look at the legislation that they brought in C-51, it says, in fact, their definition of what constitutes a threat to national security are precisely those things. Anything that affects economic security, anything that uh, challenges the authority of, uh, of, of the courts and of the, of the state, uh, so on and so forth. Um, so it brings into, into a, I guess, a sharper focus or perspective how this struggle relates to the broader struggle for a new direction for this country, um, to fight for a comprehensive alternative, which doesn't just address the issue of democracy in a narrow sense, but addresses, in fact, the system of capitalism itself that challenges the basis of that and puts forward an alternative one that puts people before profit, and so on. There's another aspect to this that <clears throat> I want to speak about, and that is that it's not just a question of strengthening the repressive arms of the state inside of the country. It is being accompanied with a drive to militarism, aggression, and war. And this is, again, an aspect of this um, issue which I don't think has been sufficiently addressed yet, but it is part and parcel of that. You use people's insecurity and fears, and you say you're going to protect them, and the way to protect them is to launch a war on terror, an unending war on terror. You increase arms spending. You know, you glorify the military. You whip up national chauvinism, and you flag, you, you, you wave Canadian flags, and, and so on. And then you engage in aggressive uh, alliances, military alliances, uh, uh, wars, and occupations abroad. And that's why uh, our party, for instance, sees a direct link between this and what's going on, obviously, in Iraq, what went on in Afghanistan, uh, the aggressive posturing of NATO as, as, an, as an aggressive military uh, alliance, uh, and so on. And you know, it's a dance which we have seen before. Um, there's a lot of talk about how, you know, the Tories talk a lot about, well, the Holocaust didn't start with gas chambers, it started with uh, speeches. In fact, <laughs> you know, I think maybe sometimes they, they, they refer to this because they want to obscure the fact that it's precisely what is taking place now is a, is a, has really close parallels to what started happening in Germany in the 30s or in Italy, you know. Um, this year marks the 70th anniversary of the victory over fascism in, in Europe and in, and in Japan and Asia. Um, and I suppose at the time of that historic victory, there was a hope that we had broken the back of fascism. But we know that <clears throat> that wasn't the case, and that fascism uh, has continued to uh, um, be a danger. And obviously, it's reflected in the, uh, in the coup against Allende and the Pinochet regime, other fascist regimes uh, around the world. And in fact, what we're seeing happening, <clears throat> not only in Canada, but uh, in many uh, countries around the world today, is the putting in place of the basis for uh, fascist authoritarian uh, control. Uh, and we say so um, with a lot of uh, caution. Because, you know, we don't think it's right for people just to bandy around the word fascism, you know. Everything's fa fascist, you know. You know, my mother's a fascist because she won't let me go to the dance, uh, to, you know. No, fascism has a very specific and scientific meaning. And it means the overt, brutal dictatorship of capital when they can't rule by other means. Right? When the consensus, the bourgeois democratic consensus, and keeping the people in line and going to the polls every five years, and but you know, keeping the economic interests of capital 
uh, safe and secure. When that starts to break down, they resort to more overt, brutal forms of dictatorship. Uh, and so fascism is not an exception, it's not an alternative to capitalism, it springs in fact from the class dynamic of capitalism itself. That's a kind of a scary thing, conclusion to come to, because what it implies is that uh, things could get worse before they start getting better. You know? And that's they not... They can't get worse. Well, they can't get worse, but they might get worse. And we need to... Uh, part of resisting that and of turning things around and fighting for a new direction is to be conscious of that danger, not to delude ourselves and think that, well, it's just a question of the Harper government, or let's get rid of Harper as important as we absolutely need to do, you know? And it was, <laughs> I don't want to take, I don't want to sound like, well, we don't think it really matters, we're all the same. No, Harper and the Conservative Party are the preferred, preferred party of monopoly capital in this country and of, of, of imperialist interest in this country. They're the main purveyors of that line. And they're doing it with a, a very vicious uh, and dictatorial authoritarian agenda. So it's absolutely vital to defeat Harper in October. And we need to do everything possible in the circumstances um, that present, present themselves to do so. But at the same time, we, we need to recognize that it's not a question of individuals or even particular political parties, but of a crisis of the system itself and of the class struggle itself. Um, so I think I am going to uh, stop there. I, I hope that I've uh, impressed upon you <clears throat> the fact that, at least from our party's point of view, and we're doing what we can as a small party. We have uh, not only in the pages of People's Voice, and mass leaflet that we put out, uh, but also on our websites. Uh, if you go to our, our website, you'll see that there's a special section, Stop 51 campaign, with all sorts of resources and so on. Uh, we've been trying to use social media a lot more effectively than we have in the past, and I think we're having some, some good results with that. And I should say that, interestingly enough, wherever communists have been on the platform at these actions, there is a palpable, um, more positive reception to our involvement and what we have to say and what we have to offer. It shows that things are happening, they are changing. And uh, it so happens that <clears throat> this uh, struggle has arisen at a time when we've also been in a party building campaign uh, across the country and the YCL has been very active in, in, in uh, building and growing. And the results of that are really quite positive around the country. The party is growing. We're setting up new clubs. The YCL is doing a kick-ass job. And they are, uh, young people are coming out more and more uh, and wanting to find out about Marxism, find out about the socialist alternative, to use the S word, and to use the C word. We, we even have, I was showing uh, Doug, uh, groups that are springing up um, in places like Sudbury and, and elsewhere, setting up websites in support of the Communist Party, and they're not even our members, <laughs> but they've decided that they want, they want to support the party, and they're doing some incredible things. It shows that something is happening. People are starting to add things together and come to a conclusion. So we should be optimistic, but we should also be, you know, not, uh, what is it? rose-colored glasses, we, you know, we have to look at reality as it is. And on the basis of that, that should give us not fear, not defeatism, but should give us strength to, to carry forward the struggle in these new and trying and difficult conditions. But we can win, because we know there's no alternative. It's either that or the destruction of our environment, the destruction of our planet through war and aggression. There is no alternative um, but a revolutionary change and a new uh, direction for our country. So thank you.